and booster shot uh, with all the new material, well, fairly new anyway. Um, again, just to recap, uh, Clarence Williams, a very fine piano player, composer, band leader, etc., etc. He was born in a place called Plaquemine in Louisiana, near New Orleans, in 1898. Died in New York in 1964. And in the 66 years in between, he packed in over a thousand records for 34 different labels, which is pretty good, really. He wrote or co-composed, uh, co decomposed, decomposed uh, over 500 tunes, including classics like Sister Kate, High Society, and West End Blues. He played with uh, most of the great figures of jazz. He was friends with J. Ron Morton, Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, uh, Joe Oliver, J. Ron Morton, Red Allen, James P. Johnson, Johnny Dance, Jimmy Newton, uh, I could go on. No, <laughs> never met him. Not only a piano player and composer, but uh, Clarence was also a music publisher, an A&R man, a singer, a band leader, a dancer, a talent agent, and even a junk blower. Uh, we're having some junk blowing later on. <laughs> by and large, he was uh, liked by his fellow musicians. He was certainly well respected. He was known to be very astute in his business dealings, which is how Williams got onto all kinds of record labels. Um, it's kind of the old arrangement, I'll publish your tune if you'll let me have half the composing rights, or I'll record your tune if you can have, let me have half the composing rights. So, well, again, the Duke Ellington played as well. But he did give a lot of lucrative employment to an awful lot of jazz men, including during the leaner years of the 30s. We're going to play some of his music today, obviously uh, not uh, all thousand tunes. We'll probably get in about 20 of them, but uh, here they are going to be played today by this specially assembled orchestra of uh, outstanding musicians. Um, Mr. Derek Fleck on the reeds. <laughs> Brian Chester on the trombone. <laughs> Matt Smith on guitar and banjo. <laughs> and uh, specially brought in for this occasion, Mr. Warren Latham on the drums. Philip Rutherford on the sousaphone. And uh, Mr. John Penn on piano. John, of course, will be uh, playing Clarence's part today. We, we tried to persuade him to get his head specially clamped to get that elongated Williams look, but he, he wouldn't do it. Very similitude goes only so far. And lastly, we have, uh, and he has to be for the purposes of this first tune, uh, a mystery clarinetist, whose identity will be revealed later on. Clarence uh, started professionally in New Orleans in 1913, and then moved to Chicago in 1917. But shortly after, in 1920, he made the big career move to New York, foreseeing that that was where the action was going to be in the long term. In 1921, two big events, he married singer Eva Taylor. He, she stayed his wife for the next 43 years until he died. He made his own first recording, and uh, for those of you who are taking notes down there, you know, place, it's, uh, his first recording was called, If You Don't Believe I Love You, Look What a Fool I've Been. <laughs> um, okay, a snappy title. Huh? He spent the next two years making over 100 blues accompaniments uh, to, amongst others, Bessie Smith. And in 1923, he got his big breakthrough as a leader when he was asked to record his own Blue Five for the OK label. Here's one from that first session. It's called the Aiken Hearted Blues. And as I say, this featured an unknown clarinet player, played here by the Mystery Reed Man. <laughs>
and the identity of the mystery clarinetist, it's Mr. Matthias Seifert. Yeah. I'm also revealed that uh, we have illustrious guests sitting out on the other side of the hall there, several members of the Hot Antic Jazz Band from Nîmes and Morocco and places like that. Hot Antic. And it's a little World Cup prelude. In December 1924, Clarence was back in the OK studios with uh, the Blue Five. There was a different lineup, this time featuring uh, known people and uh, the brilliant talents of Sidney Bechet and young Louis Armstrong. Together, they made this rather wistful little number, which came from the review Dixie to Broadway. The original vocal was by Eva Taylor, and the tune's called I'm a Little Blackbird.
Yeah. I'm a little black bird. Still with the Hot Five and its uh, stellar personnel, Clarence is back again in January of 25 to record a tune called Cakewalk in Babies. But uh, two months earlier, he made the same tune without a vocal uh, for Jeanette, another label, under the name of the Red Onion Jazz Babies. So here's Derek Fleck on soprano to be Mr. Bechet. And uh, this is the original tempo, rather fast. The ads in the Chicago Defender said, this one is a whammy doodle, don't miss it.
Uh, we're going to leave out some of the novelty bits. I mean, it's a slightly bigger band today, but uh, the cornetist on this original was the immortal Joe King Oliver. Now, luckily for me, the King was having a bad day and coming towards the end of his career, so... It was a very... I should very, very... It's very difficult to play as badly as this, I have to tell you. <laughs> and it's called, uh, What Do You Want Me To Do?
and the most sniggering of the night, please, called Bottomland, <laughs> starring Ed 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 Edmondson. Anyway, sadly, it only lasted a few weeks at the Princess Theatre in New York. Uh, but Clarence did record a couple of tunes from the show, and here's the, the title track made by uh, Clarence Williams' Jazz Kings. It's called uh, I'm Going Back to Bottomland. And the Bottomlands, I think, was the fertile alluvial soil in the floodplain of the Mississippi River, for those of you who know. Get that? Am I going too fast? <laughs> this, this gentleman has a chronicle of, of, uh, of traditional jazz, both from here and the States, that is unbelievable. unbelievable. How about you, you send him the script afterwards? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's enormous, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>
to describe the Mississippi and uh, recorded by Clarence Winsor in August 1927. And it, this is one of the tunes for the show written by Fats Waller.
interesting that the Wall Street crash was just around the corner. In, but he sailed happily into 1929 uh, with yet more new tunes like this one, which he composed and recorded in February of 1929. It's a number called If You Like Me, Like I Like You, or if you're an English public schoolboy, If One Likes One, Like One Likes One. <laughs> Not in the dormitory after lights up. <laughs> there, is, there is another title that could connect with this one. It's a, uh, I like what I like, like I like it. So could you like me like I like you? I like what I like, like I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it at the same time. <laughs> He wrote a tune called How Am I Gonna How Am I Gonna Do It If I Don't Know What You Crave? <laughs> Band in uh, October 29, as I 
I seem to recall. Uh, just as the depression hit, so just as everybody lost all their money, he came out with a tune rather ironically entitled, I've got what it takes, but it breaks my heart to give it away. <laughs> this is a fairly lengthy process. Some people think all thimbles are the same, but they're not. They're neatly numbered. Unfortunately, his fingers aren't. Which reminds me of the time the uh, Australian sheep rancher came home unexpectedly and found his wife in bed with the flying doctor. And he said, what the bloody hell's going on here? And the flying doctor said, oh, relax, Fred, he said. Uh, Sheila here's got a temperature and I'm just checking how bad her fever is. And he said, is that so? Well, I tell you, Doc, that thing better have numbers on it when you pull it out. <laughs>
to give it away. We're going to uh, stay on the washboard for this next number uh, as we play for you a tune which I hope will be a novelty to uh, many of you. It's called Where That Old Man River Flows. Now, Clarence recorded this in uh, 1930, about July 1930. Although his recording activities had slowed down a lot, and over 100 sides in 1928, less than 40 in 1930, but he was still getting his publishing royalties coming in, and uh, he and Eagle were getting plenty of radio work. He was singing gospel quartets on the radio. Anything, anything to tell him about. Anyway, July 1930, still using Floyd Casey and his trusty washboard, here's the tune called Where That Old Man River Flows.
Stuart and I stole from the Hot Antic Band, then I found the original recordings by Clarence Williams, Morocco 5. And this is a composer, it wasn't composed by Clarence Williams, it was composed by Joe Jordan, who also wrote that teasing rag. Anyway, this is the Morocco blues. Sorry to the Hot Antic Band, but I just like it as much as they do. <laughs>
Williams was known, and in fact on record did, play the jug. Now well, this is a tune that he did record uh, playing the jug, but mercifully Phil Rutherford broke the band's jug last night, <laughs> trying to get the last drops out. <laughs> so uh, now here's a proto-blues tune, it's one of those eight bar sequences. Even before the twelve bar blues, um, it's a tune called uh, Sitting on Top of the World. Recorded by people as diverse as blues singer Robert Johnson, uh, saxophonist Lester Young, uh, someone called Mick Jagger, and uh, the Memphis Jug Band, and I've heard of them. You know. uh, Clarence recorded it in 1930, one of his fairly rare straight bluesish performance. Here he is, sitting on top of the world.
trying to uh, get out of chronological sequence now. My excuse for doing this is that this tune wasn't released in Britain until 1932. It came out in 1927 in America, but then they're always ahead of us over there, aren't they? Well, sometimes. The title of this tune was Take Your Black Bottom Outside. When it did finally get issued over here, the powers that be, for some unknown reason, decided to retitle it so British record buyers knew it for those who had acquired a copy of the uh, parlophone. The, it was titled Stop That Black Bottom Dance. Sounds like something in, something in the Ministry of Culture. Stop That Black Bottom Dance at once, it's degenerate. Anyway, whatever the title, here it is, you know, it's double or even single entendre glory. There'll be a slight intermission here while I oil my third valve. Ladies, please avert your eyes. <laughs> Let's add on. Spencer Williams, published by the Clarence Williams Music Publishing Company, and it's entitled, I Found a New Baby.
play now a tune called I'd Like to Go Back in the Evening to that old sweetheart of mine. Uh, this is a tune Clarence wrote and recorded in 1933. Um, Clarence Williams Orchestra is run back in the lovely Eva Taylor. he decided to revive a risque little number he'd first made back in 1924 when he was just setting out as in his women's recording career accompanying the singer Virginia Liston. It's a number written by Eddie Green who specialised in double entendre lyrics and uh, it's called You've Got the Right Key but the Wrong Keyhole. Find you that baby, 
if you can. Cause I'm gone without a doubt. The things got tough and he came back up to her front door. And he put his key to her lock, but the key wouldn't fit no more. So he pushed it in and he tweaked it round and round. And then he pulled it out. And just as he was about to stick it in again, he heard Miss Liza shout. You've got the wrong key, but the wrong key hole. Wouldn't take a look at you, you saved my life and soul. Last night I went down to the hardware store, and you locked one on my front door. I got a new man, he's better than you. He starts his life, honey, when you get through. So take my advice, don't hang around my door. Cause your key don't fit my lock no more. You got the right key, but you're messing with the wrong keyhole. Yes, sir. still featured Floyd Casey and his trusty washboard, which by now must have been worn to a nubbin, along with Floyd Casey's trusty fingers. But uh, in sharp contrast to the, a lot of the backward-looking material that Clarence is recording at this time, this tune has a kind of a, a modernistic feel to it for 1934. Um, checking around with some of the other musicians and bands, this is possibly the first time this tune has been played since 1934. Uh, it's called I'm Getting My Bonus in Love. And on the original record, it features a syncopated riff at the beginning.
to do at least four more of these programs, so if uh, Mr. Minion decides to uh, show out again, we'll do some more of them for you. Anyway, Clarence made his last commercial recordings in uh, 1938, then sold his publishing company to uh, the Decca Company in 1943 for a very comfortable $50,000, which was a lot of money in those days. Uh, he retired from music and still made a good living from all the royalties, because he made sure he kept a he kept hold of those. And he also ran an antique shop in Harlem. Young white record collectors used to go in there in the late 40s, early 50s and talk to him about uh, the great days of the 20s. Uh, in 1953, he was actually planning a musical comeback as he saw the, uh, oh, I won't call it the Trout Revival, the, the revival of interest in earlier jazz coming on. But sadly, he got hit by a taxi while crossing the road and uh, badly injured. And that was the end of the musical plans. And his health went downhill from there. And he had a stroke and died in Queen's General Hospital on November the 6th, 1964. In quite young age, of over 66. Well, uh, well, Clarence may be gone, but his glorious music, as you've heard this afternoon, is still very much at evidence. We hope you hope you've enjoyed listening to some of it today from Brian Chester on the slide trombone. <laughs> Max Smith on the banjo and guitar. Phil Rutherford on the mighty brass box. Ron Nathan on drums, much more than vocal. John Payne on the piano forte. And our special guest brought to you all the way from Reading, Mr. Matthias Seifert. A wonderful thing for British jazz because Matthias uh, is living with his wife in Reading for the next year or so. Or, yeah. So festival directors will continue to say, festival directors will continue to say, all the way from Germany, in the hope that you'll think that they've shelled out huge amounts of money. Uh, anyway, it's a joy to have you with us, Matthias, as always. And uh, of course, if I may be permitted one small commercial, he'll be back with the rest of the usual suspects at Whitley Bay in July for more of this classic jazz. Oh, I'm sorry. I f yes, I forgot. Derek, didn't I? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. The customary emolument, yes. And of course, on clarinet and saxophones, Derek Fleck. Yeah. More importantly, I've forgotten myself, but there we are. That was it. <laughs> Um, if you like this music, you can take some of these great tunes home with you on, on CD. We've got one or two of those left. Just, uh, in fact, just two copies of the Clarence Williams CD with Bent Person and Keith Nichols on it. Um, but there's some other stuff there with uh, lots of Clarence tunes on. We're going to finish off with, anyway, perhaps the most famous piece of music associated with Clarence Williams. It was published by his music publishing company, although he didn't write this one. It's called High Society. Yeah. 
Thank you. Let's 